In mid-October, EV Central printed an article saying this. They said the new BYD C-Line 7 had a new big battery, which would mean it would steal sales from the Tesla Model Y, from Leap Motor, and from Xpeng's G6. They said this new big battery would mean it would have up to 700 kilometers of range. It turned out they were very wrong. In fact, because the new C-Line 7 is so much heavier than its rivals, its range, even with this new big battery, 91.3 kilowatt hours, is actually less than all of its direct competition by a significant margin. Guys, unfortunately, I could not make it to the Seed Lion 7 launch where I could actually test drive this car, but a journalist that I know did, and he's given a very honest review. I honestly feel like a lot of the media just say what they think car companies want them to say because then it kind of keeps the gravy train rolling. So here is, I'm going to share with you a very, very honest review of the BOD Sea Lion 7. One very positive thing about the car, one okay thing, and one thing that would mean you might consider not buying it. Then again, maybe you will. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. I'm Sam Evans. You're watching the Electric Viking. Great to have you with us. Now, I should disclose I have bought an XPeng G6. It is clearly a rival for this car. Although the XPeng G6 is about 350 kilograms lighter, maybe 400 kilograms lighter, that's about 900 pounds. Yeah, you can see where the issues start to arise now. Okay, so the BYD C-Line 7, it is the SUV version of the BYD Seal. Pretty much the same car, very similar in many, many ways. If you've got a BYD Seal or you've test driven one, you'll find that the cars are similar, but there are some differences. And some of those differences are maybe not so positive. That, that's when it comes to things like suspension, uh, body roll, etc. However, the Sea Lion 7 will be on sale in numerous markets around the world within the next few months. And this is a direct rival to the Tesla Model Y. Now, Ilya Verpreit, he writes for Autocar. And he's shared a review. I've read some of his reviews before. And he, well, put it this way. He tells what he, he says honestly what he thinks. And there's a lot of reviewers, a lot of people out there, you know they're not telling you the full truth. I've met some of them. They're, they're saying privately to me what their opinions of the cars are. And then I read the review and I don't see their real true opinion. Or I watch the video, I don't see their real true opinion. Ilya doesn't hold back though. He says the BYD C line, although it's meant to be a rival for the Tesla Model Y, is just not really good enough to be a, a direct rival. Why is that? Well, first of all, let's have a look at the specs of the car. Ilya says that the C line 7 is, guys, keep in mind, BYD did offer me a trip to China. Um, they have been considerate to me, and they probably won't like the fact that I'm sharing this review with you. So I'm sorry, but I just think it needs to be said because some of these issues are the things I mentioned, which were issues with the BOD Addo 3 when I bought it years ago. And they should have been changed by now. I think they should have anyway. Now, Ilya says that the C-Line 7 is quiet at speed and it has comfortable seats, but he says it's a mediocre car all around. It's got poorly controlled suspension, too soft maybe, potentially, disconnected steering, poor control layout, it's inefficient, and the ADAS system is irritating and doesn't work very well. And that's a problem that is still plaguing BYD's cars to this day. It's probably one of the reasons why I didn't buy the BYD Shark. BYD knows, they absolutely know that their ADAS, their safety systems, um, their lane keeping assistance, it's it's not good enough yet. I don't think it is. It needs to improve. And that's well, one of the reasons why they've hired so many engineers. They're investing billions of dollars into improving their ADAS system. And I'm sure that they will. I'm sure they're gonna, I'm sure they're gonna be one of the best in the world within the next five years, but they're not yet. When it comes to design and styling, Ilya says that the positives are, um, there's a, a good choice of powertrain configurations and the car is quite powerful. But he says that, um, Range of the C-Line 7 is not near the class leaders. Charging speed is slow. Uh, it looks plain and it's a very heavy car. Now, when it comes to the looks of this car, I actually don't mind the looks. So, Ilya, I disagree with you. I think it does look good. 
but it is heavy and that's a big problem. Now, the dual motor version of this car is about 2,450 kilograms. It's nearly 2,500 kilograms. That's just too heavy. Keep in mind though, that does come with a pretty big battery. The standard range battery is an 82.5 kilowatt hour battery. Now, obviously that's gonna be relatively heavy. Now that model comes with either a 308 horsepower single rear motor, which is around about 220 kilowatt, or an extra 215 horsepower front motor for a total of 523 horsepower, which is well over 300 kilowatt of power. The single motor car gets 300 miles of range. The dual motor gets 283 miles. So about 500 kilometers or a bit under 500 kilometers of range, about 480 kilometers for the single motor version. That's not too bad, but keep in mind, that's a big battery pack. Uh, yeah, that's one of the issues that I think it's gonna face because of course, when you call the car a Tesla Model Y killer, you've got to remember that it's a moving target. By the time this car comes to market, the new Tesla Model Y Juniper will be on the market. You've got other, other options, which I've already mentioned, like the XPeng G6. You've got the new Hyundai Ioniq 5, which has a longer range, much longer range than this car. And really, the question here is, will this be competitive? Now, on one issue, I like this car, and I'll get to that in a second. One very big positive that this has over Hyundai, over Hyundai. Hyundai has still been criticized for this. Hyundai has still been criticized for this problem with their cars that BYD and Tesla have fixed this problem, but I'll get to that in a second. Ilya said this, despite increasingly sophisticated technology for the drive batteries, EVs have tended to stick with old school lead acid batteries for the 12 volt batteries. The c line uses a lithium ion phosphate battery. That's what Tesla have done as well for a few years now. Tesla have been using lithium ion phosphate batteries for their 12 volt battery. That battery has an eight year warranty. So that's the problem, all right? Uh, Hyundai and Kia, both of them still use lead acid 12 volt batteries. As far as I know, they do anyway. If I'm wrong, correct me in the description. And that's been a bit of a problem for them. So that's one positive with this car. Now getting back to the batteries and the range, there is a longer range version of the C-Line. It has a pretty damn large 91.3 kilowatt hour battery. That's a blade battery, not the version two new blade battery. If it was, this thing would have a lot, of, a lot more range than it does. But anyhow, with that big 91.3 kilowatt hour battery, it gets 312 miles of range. Still not really that much. I mean, that's only about 500 kilometers of range. It's good, but considering the size of the battery, you might expect a bit more range. Now, the reason it doesn't get much more range is because it's quite heavy. What about charging speed? Well, the smaller batteries can charge, or the 80 kilo, 82 kilowatt hour batteries, they'll charge at 150 kilowatt charging speeds. The larger 91 kilowatt hour battery charges at 230 kilowatt. Both of those numbers, not too bad, 150, 230, but they're clearly not up to the class leaders, are they? I mean, some of the class leaders now are 350. Uh, the G6 XPeng is about 290, but it can maintain that 290 for quite a while. Uh, then you have other rivals such as Zika's EVs that can charge it up to 400 kilowatt. So you can see BYD when it comes to battery technology and charging speeds, they are starting to fall behind a little bit. And that's why some journalists are saying that this is not a new Tesla Model Y Juniper rival really. The C-Line 7, because it uses this pretty much the same cabin as the SEAL, does have a fairly nice interior, say journalists. It has, or says Ilya, it has high quality materials. It's fairly spacious. It has a comfortable driver's seat with plenty of adjustability. But one thing areas that let it down to this, in practical infotainment and control layout, it has no step up in perceived quality from the SEAL. Not that that's really a problem, I don't think. And it has a perched driving position. So some, some journalists who have sat in this car find the driving position to be a bit awkward. Anyhow, here's one big positive. Ilya said this, BYD is clearly listening to feedback when it comes to its infotainment, hence the permanent shortcut bar and the additional configurability. And basically, you can change what the shortcut bar has depending on what your needs are. Apple CarPlay is now also more integrated into the native interface, so music shows in the standard media player. These are positive steps, but there's a long way to go. So here's the thing. Reviewer journalists are saying that the media screen still is behind some of the competition and it can be um, a little bit challenging to deal with. Anyway, the interior is dominated by an enormous rotating touchscreen, which I think is a good feature, that touchscreen. It runs a new generation of software, which is prettier and praise B now has a permanent bar at the bottom with a bunch of shortcuts 
and basic climate controls. Much better, but it's still pretty dreadful, says Ilya. It's riddled with wonky translations, unfathomable menus, and wasted space. And on my test car, I couldn't get Apple CarPlay to work, either wirelessly or with the cable. Practicality is decent. Rear passengers have acres of legroom, but not the most comfortable seating position because the floor is quite high. The boot has exactly the same volume as the Hyundai Onyx Onyx 5 and is similarly shallow. And there's a useful 58 liter frunk that's slightly fiddly to access. So it does have a frunk, 58 liter frunk and boot space is the same as the Hyundai Ionic 5. So when it comes to the engines and performance, the positives were this, it's fast and it has good drivability. Negative was very, very, very bad ADAS. Driving the Sea line 7 is relatively simple. There's two drive modes and two levels of regen braking. They don't make all that much difference between the two of them. I think the regen braking, it should be improved in VOD's cars. They should have the ability to completely stop the car. So I've gotten used to, I got used to in California driving a Tesla Model 3 with full regen braking. And I thought it was great. I never used the brakes, never, ever, ever used the brakes. That is an area where I think BYD, they should change. They should have full regen braking so you don't need to use your brakes. Despite a curb weight of nearly 2.5 tons, 523 horsepower makes the C-Line 7 very fast and its power delivery and braking are smooth with no noticeable issues. That isn't to say that there's no typical new brand weirdness about the C-Line 7 though. It starts with the assisted driving features which are diabolical. The overspeed warning doesn't just bong, it also dims your music and, and turning off the audible warning, pretty easy to do, turns off the visual speed limit indicator. There are two stages of lane keeping assistance to disable. One is so constant that it feels like you've got a flat tire. The driver monitoring system will nag you if you look in the mirrors. Sometimes, but not always, weirdly, a voice will tell you ACC active when you turn on the cruise control. When I bought my BYD 3 at 03, I found some of the similar issues with the ADAS and the, um, to be honest, the overall operation of the car. I made a video about this and I was just, wow. Some people who own the 803, they hate me. BYD fans, they hated me for actually pointing out my experiences and doing what Ilya's doing, just telling it how he experienced it, telling what his experience was. So, you know, when it came time to, when, well, to be honest, when we had to sell that car because we had needed to raise money for Shannon's cancer, um, treatments. I wasn't, to be honest, that concerned. Um, these were the key reasons. We had these challenges and I think it's worth pointing them out because other people are afraid of doing it. You know what? I'm never going to change. So I'm always going to tell the truth. I'm always going to tell people how, how it is. And I think that's how journalism should be. We should be objective. Even if people don't like it, even if brand fans are going to trash us and unsubscribe from our channel and say really cutting, hurtful, negative things about you online, you've still got to keep telling the truth. Ride and handling, here are the pros. Ride is fairly soft. I don't really like it when I find cars have too soft suspension, but that's a positive, says Ilya. ESC keeps things orderly and isn't too intrusive. The negatives are a disconnected feeling steering wheel and loose body control. You would expect at least a bit of handling talent to back up the generous power, but the C-Line 7 doesn't have any. As with other BODs, it was very softly suspended. Combine that with very light remote steering and you end up with a car that inspires no confidence in the bends and has pretty poor directional stability. When you get out on the power out of a corner, you can feel it start to send power to the rear axle and start to rotate, which would be a good thing in a car with more control. But in this case, it just feels disconcerting. My test car was on winter tires, but high quality Pirelli ones, so I don't expect a set of summer rubber to cure the Sea line 7's ills. But at least it's a comfy cruiser, right? Well, sort of. Although the driving position perches you over the controls somewhat, the seats are soft yet supportive, and other than a bit of wind noise, the car is pretty quiet at a cruise. But despite the soft springs, there's still a bit of weird knobbliness to the otherwise floaty ride. I'd rather have something more consistent. What about running costs and miles per gallon or efficiency? Pros, okay range and charging. Cons, said Ilya. Projected UK prices are expensive compared with rivals. Now, that won't be the case here in Australia. I think in Australia, we be priced very well. Many, many markets will be priced well. In the UK, for some reason, 
BYD cars are priced a little expensively and in Europe as well. Inefficient, so it gets only average range from quite a big battery. Now, of course, that's really down probably more than anything else to the fact that, oh, I don't know, BYD's efficiency, BYD's always struggled with efficiency in their cars. And that's a fact, that is objectively true. If you look at the BYD Auto 3 using the same battery as the Tesla Model Y, how can Tesla get more range from a much bigger car using the same size battery? Doesn't make sense. Anyhow, it's also due to the fact that this is only using lithium ion phosphate batteries. It doesn't use NMC batteries and the batteries it does use have pretty low energy density in comparison to some of the newer LFP batteries on the market. Now, test, when they test drove the car, they discovered that it wasn't getting anywhere near the WLTP figure when it comes to range. But who knows? To be honest, I don't know how they drove it. The kind of range you get from your car is probably more determined on how you drive it, the driving conditions. Are you driving in a headwind? Is there a tailwind? Is it raining? How much pressure do you have in your tires? There's lots of factors that go into range with an EV. So here's what Ilya had to say. The goods were quiet at speed, comfortable seats. The bads were poorly controlled suspension, disconnected steering, poor control layout. It's inefficient and annoying ADAS. Ilya said, until now, every BYD I've driven has felt like a notice, noticeable step up from the last. And apart from the dreadful touchscreen interface and poor ADAS, I found the seal quite an agreeable thing, but this C-Line 7 doesn't fit in that series. It's bland, not very nice to drive, and not particularly efficient. And while its user interface is a step forwards, it's still not good. Unless it turns out to be heroically cheap to buy, it's hard to see why anyone would get one over a Tesla Model Y, a Hyundai Ionic 5, or a Renault Scenic E-Tech, or I should add to that, the new Zika 7X and the Xpeng G6. Honestly, guys, I don't really understand what's happened with BYD lately. I feel like they're just making too many models. They've got what, you know, just so many models that no one, even journalists, can't keep track with all the models they, they keep bringing out. And their battery technology and charging speed hasn't advanced at the same pace. Rather than just churning out all, all these different models, which some are very similar to each other, I think if they focus more on getting those new batteries into cars, the new Blade Battery version 2 with a much higher energy density, improving charging speed and working on the dynamics and ADAS of their EVs, then rather than being sort of perceived as a cheap brand, they can improve to the point where people will see them similar to the way that they see Tesla or Zika these days. Now, is that going to happen anytime soon? I don't think so. BYD is selling so many cars right now. They just sold 500,000 vehicles, right? Last month in October, that was a new record for the company. So I think BYD are probably more focused on volume, getting vehicles out to buyers and selling as many vehicles as they can. But this could end up being a mistake. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.